my peoples, what's up? Welcome back to Shelf Stories, the channel that tells tales from games, books, and life. I am your host, Jason. Thank you so, so much for stopping by. This is another installment of my Shelf Help series, where I take a look at us as gamers and as people, and I offer tips and tricks so that we become better at both. Today's thesis is right in the title. In order to become better gamers and people, we have to learn to love failure. Not just tolerate failure, not just accept failure, but love it. And that makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> failure is terrible, it stinks. Um, I think that we only like failure when it's happening to someone else. There are few things that get a video off to a better foot than a bunch of cat fails. But I'm not talking about that today. Uh, I am not talking about the failure we encounter or see in others. I'm talking about when we disappoint and are ashamed of ourselves. I'm talking about those times where we think we've fallen short as lovers, as parents, or even as gamers. Sometimes it gets so bad we feel like we have this giant L plastered right on our foreheads for all of the world to see. How in the world can I possibly say that that is good and we need to learn to love it? So to help me through this difficult topic, uh, I want to borrow liberally from a book called Your Move. It's by Jonathan Kay and Joan Moriarty. Uh, they run the Snakes and Lattes Game Cafe in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Um, and I was pointed in the direction of this book by Michael Fenton, uh, BG user Spielrog. Hope I got that pronunciation correctly. Thank you very much for reaching out to me and being a listener and pointing me in the right direction. So before I talk about why we should love failure, I want to set some of the cultural context of why we stigmatize it so hard. So think of um, popular entertainment, right? Uh, think of the, especially competitions that we see on television and around. Um, professional sports, right? Uh, do we celebrate failure in professional sports? Uh, no way. Um, you know, we uh, love to interview the winners and then we ask the losers what happened there. Um, it don't mean a thing if you don't got that ring. That's what they say. Uh, and this one is um, based on actual science. Always, always, always the unhappiest person in any Olympic event is the silver medalist. But think about another genre of competition, reality TV. There could only be one survivor. Or, you know, on some other shows, you either get the rose or you don't. So as far as the impact of human behavior, especially as gamers, I think there is one of two ways, main ways that it uh, plays out. Um, the first one is that you get this phenomenon that we call overcompetitiveness. So um, it's good to be competitive. It's good to, you know, want to win and it's good to, you know, all that stuff. However, uh, when you look under the hood on some folks um, and you consider motivation, there are some people who they, they want to win, but it's more like they want to avoid losing. Uh, they don't want that stigma. They don't want that shame that comes with uh, losing. Um, some people say, you know, losing hurts worse than winning feels good. And like I said, you know, they can balance all that. But I think for some people, it crosses a line and becomes a little bit extra. So the second overall set of strategies that we use is to avoid the whole thing, not go at all. Um, we can't miss the shot that you don't take, right? Or maybe we do go, we do engage, we do play, but we kind of do it from this nervous closed in shell position where you know, it's almost like we kind of build in an excuse. Well, that didn't go well because I was so nervous. Well, <laughs> kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy there. I'm gonna quote Joan Moriarty from Your Move. We ignore the popular slogans that tell us to be daring, and we instead listen to the unwritten rules that tell us to be invisible. That can play out in a whole bunch of ways. That can play out for new gamers uh, when they walk into a game store and they see the giant wall of games. Look at that, <laughs> like the ones that I have back here. Um, or they, you know, they counter that gatekeeper and they just say, you know what? Nope, not doing that. Uh, going to play some Monopoly, Connect for something that's familiar and comfortable. Um, or maybe they've uh, already worked themselves up to trying a new game, but then they get that rules wall. 
uh, and they don't even want to fight with it, <laughs> you know, because like in those rules is like, I'm not going to figure this out. I'm going to fail at figuring this out. And so I'm just going to, you know, uh, push it along. Or maybe it plays out in our game groups and we're a little bit gun shy about opening people to new experiences and new games because we don't think that it'll work out. We think that uh, the worst thing in the world is to burden people and waste people's time. The last thing we want to do is be seen as a failure in our social groups. So failure is pervasive. I don't think I'm delivering any kind of news flash over there. Uh, it's there for gamers old and new. It's there for, you know, content creators like myself, for game designers. It's there, you know, in your areas, uh, at personally, professionally, in your community. Uh, everywhere you go, it seems like we are always kind of on the run uh, and trying to avoid failure as much as possible. So how do you turn all this around? How do you square with something that we've learned to avoid at all costs throughout our lives? You do it by reframing it. You do it by realizing that most of the things that we understand as failure aren't actually failures. As a matter of fact, for the most part, failure doesn't exist. You do it by realizing that there are only two options in life. You either win or you learn. Here's a quote from Nelson Mandela that I really like. I never lose. I either win or I learn. So you want me to dive deeper into motivational posters? You got it. Failure is F-A-I-L, first attempt in learning. And if you mess up the first time and you keep on at it, uh, then you are engaging in further attempts in learning. There is no learning without failure. There is no adaptation. There is no growth without failure. You fail forward, you fail fast. The most successful people in the world will t uh, tell you about it. You can load up the TED Talks, you can load up the TikToks, if TikTok still exists. Uh, you can load up so many people who are successful and they'll tell you that in failure, there is adaptation. In failure, there is accommodation and learning and growth. When you're winning all the time, you're not learning. And it's those fail moments when you can learn to kind of take failure and take what's good from it and move forward that you can really learn to love the process and love where you land at the end. I do a lot of this reframing work as a psychotherapist, a cognitive therapist, uh, and a, I see it pay a lot of dividends in my therapy. But I want to take that lens and focus it on the gaming sphere a little bit. And one more time, I'm going to borrow from, you guessed it, uh, Ms. Joan Moriarty, thank you so much, uh, and her um, first chapter in Your Move. So she talks about the magic circle. Uh, the magic circle is a concept where we're playing a game and we've chosen to suspend the normal rules of life, which for a lot of people can be very painful. We talked about those normal rules, right? You know? <laughs> Who gets the rose? Um, but we've suspended all that and we enter into a space where we've, Everybody who is at the table accepts a alternate set of rules. Uh, and for the duration of the game and for, you know, whatever time before and after, we are engaged in the space of the game and not in real life. So there's a lot to say about magic circles. I think they're really interesting. Uh, and I may do a, a video just kind of fleshing that out as a concept. But I want to focus on one particular aspect of it, which is the magic circle is a place of low stakes and low expectations. The fate of the world is not being decided uh, <laughs> at the table, even if you're playing a game of uh, pandemic or something where you're really saving the world. Um, no, you're not really. <laughs> and also along with that, the fate of your psyche is also not at stake. I, I really do think some people come in with the energy, whether they know it or not, um, that losing at the game or not doing well is like this damaging event to their psyche and that they want to avoid that at all costs. So, you know, that pressure to like kind of perform well, or maybe even that pressure, and I've even felt this myself, because um, I have a couple of people in my game group that are like, you, you lay a game out in front of them and they just see all the points. It's like Rain Man. <laughs> um, and it's like, oh man, I wish I could just, you know, be like that. Uh, and it makes me feel inadequate when I'm not. It's great to strive, but that feeling of inadequacy is something that we really need to be in touch with. And that's where the magic circle can come in because it reminds us that, hey, that inadequacy doesn't have to play into this. Um, there's low stakes here. Your, your psyche, your ego is not at stake. Just come in and enjoy and play the game.
So what can we do to improve the quality of our magic circles? Um, I think there's a couple of things that can be done, and it depends on the game that you're playing. So if you're playing a competitive game where there's clear winners and losers and all that, uh, losers. <laughs> I did it again. It sneaks right in there. Uh, where there are clear winners and not so much winners. Um, to be able to create a culture, and a lot of this just comes down to shared culture and the shared contract at the table. Um, to say that, you know, every player at the table is going to strive their best and they're going to try to win, um, you know, uh, to the best of their ability, but to make it acceptable to fail and to make it a learning opportunity. Um, you know, I, there's a lot that could be done actually with that debrief at the end, like, oh, this happened and that happened and the other thing happened. Um, to be able to kind of look at the players who didn't do so well and say, oh, wow, that strat was really interesting. You know, glad you went for that. I learned something there by watching you play. Or, um, you know, I, I actually was trying this something else. Like I, I noticed that, uh, you know, this thing, this strategy happened and I really shot for the moon. And then, you know, the entire table actually kind of buys in and, and is interested and says, oh, yeah, you know, um, you know I, I, I'm glad you kind of played that out. I learned that, you know, you know, when I when I try that strat next time, I'll build upon what you did. Um, there's so much that you can do uh, with the debrief or with how you kind of like engage the players uh, that even when they're kind of lower down on the victory track, they're still doing something. And that something is often, you know, learning, getting better and growing at the game. So at this point, I want to address something that comes up a lot uh, with game groups. So um, someone is blowing up. They're being doing the over competitive thing, uh, making uh, kind of a bad time uh, for himself or herself and everybody else. And the group responds with, yo, yo, chill. It's only a game. Um, trying to get the person to calm down. So that can work. But the problem with that is it in its own way is also a shaming uh, kind of thing to put forward. Uh, basically, you're saying, yo, stop failing at Magic Circle. Stop failing at low stakes. Um, and all you're doing when you say that or how the person receives you know, uh, calm down, it's only a game. How they receive it is, I failed again. And it just, you know, makes them matter and matter and matter. Um, and it just perpetuates a cycle you don't want to perpetuate. So, um, you know, obviously that's something that you're going to have to be in, the, that's going to have to be in the toolbox in order to try to call someone down. Um, but you can supplement it. You can say, you know, hey, it's about learning, you know, you did pretty good or, you know, you did bad. Hopefully, you know, you could do better the next time or we'll play, you know, um, we'll play something else. And, you know, that'll be something else. You know, you're probably better at this type of game. Um, there's all these things that you can do to reaffirm that it isn't just about the negative um, calm down. It is about the positive. Hey, we're, this group is about learning. And it's about fun. Uh, and it's about being together. And, you know, this person who was mad is still a part of this. And the way you, the, the thing that does, the thing that approach does, it, it directly tries to soothe the shame that is flaming the anger. I think this is true in games. I think this is true in life in general. Whenever there is anger, the chances are very, very good that there is a shame point that is triggering that anger. I like to say as a therapist, I don't do anger management. I do shame management. You're going to want to look to the shame point. And more often than not, when it's over competitiveness, that shame point is they're afraid to lose more than they're willing to win. Is that a magic bullet? No, it's another tool in the chest to keep your game group uh, going in the right direction for yourself and for everybody else. And then those cooperative games, which are my personal favorite game, you can see from my wall back there. Um, those um, tend to bring out alpha gamer. Uh, where the person is competitive and they get that tingle of I can't tolerate losing from the game state itself and they kind of drag the rest of the players along with them. Oh, this is the best move. You got to do this. Uh, all that kind of thing. And I think more needs to be done at the outset uh, in terms of building the table experience itself um, to say, you know what? Uh, this is about cooperation. This is about, um, you know, zones like you know like I, I think the biggest thing that happens in alpha gamer is like you know there's a violation of, z of spaces you know uh you know i move this piece or i move you know i i interject when somebody else is kind of taking a turn and i think like uh enforcing those like spatial and verbal boundaries a little bit more at the beginning and 
affirming that like okay the point of this isn't to just you know make boundaries the point of this is to be have that team concept and like you know we're gonna win or lose together as a team and again that takes um a lot of culture building in order to get that better joe moriarty in um your move mentions a party game uh telestrations uh, one of my favorite games but a game that can easily go off the rails uh in a number of ways um and the way that can go off the rails is by when nobody fails. So it's one of those games where like you draw a picture and somebody else has to write the word of the picture is. And then a third person has to draw a picture off that word that was guessed. And you kind of like, you know, playing telephone. And if you don't fail, the game stinks. <laughs> and if you, uh, and in most party games, um, if there's no failure, if people just kind of like guess the thing right away, then there's just nothing there. So in that, in that particular case, Learn to love failure. Learn to greet failure with laughter. Uh, you know, that not just like stigmatizing laughter, but that warm, we're in this together laughter and fail, fail, fail all the time. Fail in all sorts of games. Fail in competitive games. Fail in cooperative games. Fail at party games. <laughs> be willing to be the star of that YouTube video. Um, failure is adaptation. Failure is learning. And ultimately, failure is fun in the magic circle. So then there's that second uh, gamer, uh, the, the avoider. Uh, they don't even enter the magic circle. Um, uh, they don't play the game. They default to familiar you know, experiences. Uh, they don't want to learn new rules. They kind of like just shut down on stuff. They, you know, if they are kind of playing something, they don't take the shot. They don't do, they get just that nervous shell disappearing in that invisible cloak. Um, that Joe Moriarty described. A lot of times uh, what's behind that is this kind of like constant chatter of what if. What if I play this game and, you know, I don't have a good time? What if um, I'm, you know, I, I don't do well and I lose and I embarrass myself? Uh, what if I, you know, I go to this place or do this thing or join this group and <laughs> it's almost like we don't even get past that what if. Right, we just kind of plagued by a constant stream of it. What I like to tell clients in that situation is, okay, what if that what if real is playing? Let's let that movie play. Just play it out. What if? What is the worst that can happen? I play a new game. I didn't have fun. All right, um, you didn't have fun. Okay, you did that instead of your thousandth Sudoku. Or doom scrolling Facebook for the millionth time. Um, what if I lose and I embarrass myself? Embarrass yourself to who? I think sometimes people get the sense of like this judge with a capital J that is just like out there and waiting to judge all of our failures. And that's a kind of a mental thing that our, our brains just do that. Um, it's not actually real. Our feelings lie all the time. We, we may, you know, if we actually have adequate magic circles, and this is something that, you know, game curators should be really aware of, to build that in where it's like, okay, no, there's, there's no judge here. There's no, like, you can fail all you want. Um, and you can, you know, engage all you want and just learn. That's all, that's all this is all about. Learning, playing, exploring. No judgment. No what ifs. Just, just play. And if you don't have fun... Well, then you learned. <laughs> you can move on and go find something else that is fun, but you learned something. And that's always, always a good thing. So that's how you learn to love failure, by reframing it, by looking at it and saying, this isn't failure at all. It's learning. And I have to learn. There is no other way that human beings grow and really become capable of true winning and true excellence is by failing and adapting again and again and again. So um, I hope that you can make the, the connections in your life and in your gaming life. Uh, I hope that you can kind of build out your magic circles uh, so that they can accommodate people at, you know, wherever they are, wherever their mind space is, um, that whenever they cross that line, that magic circle, the, the judge, the thing that is like, that may be kind of plaguing their mind, just like there's no entry, <laughs> No entry for you, <laughs> unless you're playing magic and there's the judges in there all the time. I'm kidding. Uh, those judges are nice too. Um, the magic circle is a place where there's really genuinely only two things, winning 
and learning. I hope you enjoyed that shelf help segment. I hope you enjoyed that shelf story. This is Jason reminding you that if you can change your mind, you could change the world. So until next time, later, everybody. Thank you.